Welcome, Marie, to Fully Booked. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Megan. I'm very, very, very excited to be here. I am very, very, very excited to have you here. I was thrilled to read your amazing new novel, The Evening Hero. Thank you. It's been 18 years since I started it, so I'm kind of excited to. Wow. Okay. I mean... Um, just by way of introduction, I mean, there are a thousand different directions we could go off in. And this is a novel that is so rich and offers so much. But first, let's let's just let's take it down to, OK, Propulsive Literary Saga, which it, which makes it exceptional to begin with, because I am not I don't recall a recent reading experience where I was turning the pages that fast in a literary novel. So it's told in five parts with a short prologue. First sentence. His name was Young Man. Um, but who is he? Where is he? And at what point on the timeline of his life are we first encountering this character? We're encountering him on one of the worst days of his life when he's starting. He's in his 70s. He has a job that he loves. He's been the OB in a small town for probably about 40 years. He's just kind of chugging along. And then he's learning that because of private equity and consolidation that his rural hospital for basically no reason except profit is being closed. And then he's out of a job. His wife has been mean to him recently. Mm. He doesn't know what he wants to do. And coincidentally, on that same day, these mysterious letters are coming from Korea suggesting that the secret that he had thought he had left behind as a child, maybe coming back to haunt him or not. That's a lot in the first two pages <laughs> you give it. You're a very generous <laughs> novelist, Marie. I think I'm kind of like, even though I teach, a lot of times when I teach writing, it's all about remove excess words. But actually when I write, I think maybe I add more words. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I, let's let's move right into the question that we could spend the entirety of our time answering, but I'm sure we'll have little offshoots. And it's, how did this book come to be? This book is actually probably three different books. It, wow. I, well, I remember the first minute, and I actually have a little card when I wrote down the, the idea. My son has a lot of medical issues, and we were in a doctor's office. And the doctor was just offhandedly, I guess, when he looked at Philip time, he was telling me about an OB friend of his who had done a really great job delivering a baby that was in crisis. The, the, um, the mom was bleeding out and he just did a great job. He had to uh, give her a hysterectomy. And somehow, because the woman was young, she sued him for loss of fertility. The baby and the mom are fine. Oh. And she won. Wow. Yeah. So that made me kind of go, hmm. and then what if the guy was Asian and they would use all these tropes of like the Asian butcher, like no regard for life. And it kind of married with this idea of Middle March is one of my favorite books. And yes. <laughs> so I've always wanted to write a book that was, you know, not only about small village life and its minutia, but also about the doctor who tries to do the right thing. And, you know, as you know, Middle March, he accidentally kills Raffles even after everyone's trying to assassinate him. You know, the doctor tries to do the right thing and then just ends up not doing it. And so that was kind of like the moral question that I started with. You know, I ended up like haunting the courthouse in Providence where I lived, and just waiting, you know, befriending the clerk. So he'd tell me when there was a medical malpractice case. You know, I spent a whole year watching a case. Jungmann's pieces were more um, just filler. Einstein, who's Jungmann's son in the novel, mm. was more the person who was big hotshot, doctor, went to Harvard. And so that novel i wrote a whole novel about poor einstein and his medical malpractice case and then i was like this is the <laughs> book that i wanted <laughs> you know even though it was you know it had a beginning and middle and end so i started over again slowly as i was doing it young man's story started taking over more and more of it even though he was more the like honestly the filler like i have to get to this next part so here's another Youngman story. And then, you know, the, the other iteration was in 2016. So it was much more of a kind of satire about medical, you know, hijinks and capital, late stage capitalism. You know, it was a big social novel. And that, but then after 2016, 
I just felt like satire just kind of went out the window in terms of yeah. you know, the excess you need. And then at the same time, um, social media is so wonderful. In so I am I am from a really small town in Minnesota as well. Mm -hmm. And my father's not an obstetrician, but he was a long time anesthesiologist um, in our town. And so that means he's probably treated like every single person in our town, you know, births, tests, right. chance accidents. And someone in our town posted, this is when Trump was very much at you. We have to nuke North Korea and stuff. And even little kids are just talking about like killing North Koreans and stuff. And someone had posted a their bumper sticker very proudly that said 150 species of animal go extinct every day and that North Koreans should be next. Holy shit. Right? So yeah. I just thought, you know, you don't understand this person who saved your life is North Korean. And then also my, my parents also, when they first came to this country in the fifties, um, they were undocumented for a period. So, you know, it, it sounds corny, but I really ended up shifting gears with this because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I kind of, you know, as a novelist, I kind of feel like, oh, I want to write this big social novel. I have this idea of what I want to do, but then the novel found its own form. And a lot of it, it sounds simplistic, but a lot of it became, I would like to show people that North Koreans are also human. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not too low a bar <laughs> to some degree, if you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Yeah. It became so urgent. And now, you know, we're seeing even, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, there's so much anti-Asian violence going on. Yeah. That I do feel that was the correct decision for what I wanted to do artistically and otherwise, even though that was that wasn't really, you know what I mean? I kind of felt like, oh, I want yeah. to do this cool thing with startup bro tech culture you know, lacy capitalism. I mean, it still has many of those elements, but the book that is more, is more rounded. And I have to say it was actually when my agent sold it, it was 850 pages. Whoa. Yeah. I really had this David Foster Wallace thing going on. Like, no doubt. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but why not? Right. Why not? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about who gets to be David Foster Wallace. Right. You know? So like, why why not go for the gold? OK, listen, I have a billion things to say. The first thing way back at the beginning of this answer was I, at the beginning of my career when I was, first, you know, one of the first authors I interviewed for Kirkus was Wilton Barnhart, who wrote uh, Look Away, Look Away, you know, great comic satirical novel of the South. And he told me, I'll never forget, he's like, basically, he's like all novels. The best novels are three novels stapled together like three novels on top of one another make make the most robust gift bag of a novel oh wow in my yeah in my estimation and so i love that you said that this one's like three books in one because i was like no wonder i find this so reading experience so invigorating on that tip that is okay. so funny exactly i know <laughs> yeah yeah put it all in there baby that that's that's life life isn't neat and tidy you know and life even the bleakest subjects have humor in them too there's just no teeth it all out of that great, great big ball of being alive. Speaking of being alive, I found it like I find it interesting because it's like, you know, what what can fiction do and not do? Like, what does story do and what can it do? I mean, you can't download the experience of what it feels like to be a person in a particular body in the world into like the brain of another person. Like we can never understand one another in that way, but we tell stories to point towards a richer understanding of what it may be like to be somebody else, to be from somewhere else, to go through something else. Uh, there's a great line in, towards the end of this book, and it's um, uh, Young Man is opening up to his lifelong friend, Ken. And there's this line, it would take a lifetime of recounting stories to get Ken to understand what he had been through. You know, he just tells one story, but it would take a whole lifetime's worth to really communicate to him the depth and the breadth of what he's trying to say. And it's frustrating because, like you said, yeah. no one can really do that for you. Yeah. I think what yeah. else with this in particular mm -hmm. was, I'm also a big fan of Chekhov. You know, yeah. and how he uses sort of minutia of life to sort of express emotions. But then I decided I'm kind of doing a reverse checkoff because I feel like he kind of tells the story of joy, but with the pain that's beside it. Sort of like you can't have joy without the pain beside it. But then for Yohan, it's more like he's got all the pain and then to some degree he's missing the joy that's beside it. So I, right. as readers, I hope we, we pick up on it, but he's kind of, his story is, is 
you know, like for a lot of Koreans of that era was was very difficult. Right, right. And through the five sections and the way you've arranged them in this book, we see different points of his life at different times. I mean, section three, you know, we return to his young life, his childhood in Korea during the war. And it's it really it really builds this crescendo, you know, like where he winds up in this book, obviously, is not where he begins. And, you know, the arc of his development is so, so satisfying to behold. Oh, I'm so glad because it's also, it's not, it breaks some timeline rules, which I wanted yeah. to break. Yeah. So, good. Yeah. 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 It, it breaks the timeline rules and, and yet it builds in a way that made perfect sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so basically, I think, you know, it, it's fair to say that, you know, through all five sections, it, the book is, you know, at the center, in part, exploring like the many obstacles he faces on on his journey from boyhood, you know, to manhood and 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 beyond and trying to pass along, you know, the wisdom he's earned to his son, Einstein. Yes. And where Einstein, because he doesn't know his background, doesn't yeah. receive his wisdom in the way your man wishes it would be received. Yeah. Oh, um, speaking of not receiving in the way you wish it would be received, you mentioned the word sarcasm, and it's a word that gets used in this book as well. And it made me smile because um, it's something that Young Man puz has puzzled over in his life. And it really drove me back to like what this word means and like how it can be used as a tool in fiction. And I mean, one thing that this book reminded me of is how dependent on fluency you know, getting sarcasm can be, but not just fluency in language, also, you know, picking up on contextual clues, because you can be fluent in the same language and somebody could be saying sarcastic. You might still need to turn to your friend and say, was that sarcasm? Oh, exactly. So that's why Jungman doesn't understand people are making fun of him for the longest time. So he gets doubly mad when he figures it out. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, how, if you have, if you see it this way, how, how is, did you employ sarcasm in this book? Well, for instance, one of the doctors who is a, kind of always looking down on him is, and it, some of it has to do with the dynamic of generally the surgeon is sort of the talk dog of the hospital and tends yeah. to look down on people. And I think I got a little bit of this from my father because as the anesthesiologist, actually the anesthesiologist is actually the more important position uh, my father actually took um, part in some of very pioneering, like successful, I need to add, open heart surgeries. Mm. A lot of the early ones were not successful. Um, so when you yeah. think about it, the anesthesiologist is the person who's keeping the person alive. And so in general, the way, well, it's kind of funny the way the doctors think of each other. So the anesthesiologists tend to think of the surgeon <laughs> as the carpenter because they're just slicing and dicing and bone saw yeah. and everything. But the surgeons always feel, it's kind of like being the quarterback. So, uh, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. they get to boss yeah. everyone around. So Jungman has always had this push-pull relationship where he kind of wants to be friends with the surgeon who's a jerk. And the surgeon keeps kind of nagging him a little bit by calling him, yeah. his name is Quack, and he calls him Quack. And But Jungman doesn't catch on right away. And then there's just other... He, Jungman doesn't really get... Um, when or a lot of times his daughter-in-law is like thank you he's kind of, <laughs> oh god uh, okay well that was weird that's kind of his reaction because he doesn't really understand and then also in korean there are different like total ways that you express things but generally mm -hmm. sarcasm wouldn't be expressed in as much i think it would be more if you got in a car accident and someone would say, thank you, respected driving teacher. Like they would <laughs> my language. I think that's what they do a lot more with, with like the different levels. So the sarcasm would be, you know, you're calling this person teacher when yeah. you're calling him an asshole for our age. Okay. That is a sick burn. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Now, um, you were one of the first full, you were the first Fulbright scholar to Korea for creative writing. That is correct. And one of a hand, yes, congratulations. Thank you. Hey, and one of a handful of American journalists granted a visa to North Korea since the Korean War. How did your experiences in Korea imbue, uh, how did they affect this novel? You know, 
Because what's funny is like now everyone's watching all these K dramas and like Squid Game and everything. And yeah. one of the things I'm realizing when I, I can kind of see the translations go by, it's not like my Korean's awesome, but so much of the way the language works. In fact, I was discussing this with a friend yesterday where um, they would translate something like, oh, he helped you get to the hospital. But what the word in Korean would be, like he put you on his back and took you to mm. the hospital. Even if that's just metaphorical, just the whole yeah. idea of putting someone on your back is not only like shouldering their burden and their responsibility, so it has so much, there's so much like richness in that. And then similarly, just understanding how the different hierarchies work. So if the hospital is already a very hierarchical place and yeah. so is the village. But then understanding in Korean, like how much, you know, the age works. And a lot of times, like one of the sort of funny things people will do is, so it's very prescribed. You never would use a certain... um kind of language with someone who's older. And in fact, there really aren't swear words in Korean. What you would do is you would use the mm-hmm. same word you'd use for kid. Um, like, inyosok is like, hi, little rascal. But if you said that to an adult, you'd be calling them a, a mother effer, basically. <laughs> because that's... Got it. Because the, yeah. the levels are too much. Mm-hmm. So, and then the, there would just be so many, like, funny jokes where people would you know, talk to you at too low a level. And then as soon as you start getting mad, they would just add a yo. So adding the yo puts it up a level immediately. It's like you're leveling up immediately. So there are just yeah. so many, and and just sort of seeing the different, how, so we don't really have a lot of relatives because both my parents are from North Korea. And we mm-hmm. have one like living relative. It was actually um, my cousin who was much older. He's like, he'd be an uncle's age, but my mother fled across the DMZ in 1945 with him in her arms. Mm. And so he's like wow. one of her like last relatives. So instead of, you know, a lot of people like lived in the dorm and did stuff. I made sure like I lived with my family, did as much as I could do possibly. Um, I was taking Taekwondo at the same time. And I joined like a gym with just Koreans. And I just kind of was trying to get in that mindset of what are Koreans like and because obviously I was born here and my parents were very Americanized. My parents, you know, fluent mm-hmm. English when they came here. So that just gave me a lot more context in and also, you know, because a lot of the sort of um someone described very beautifully um <laughs> on Instagram is cringe, <laughs> the immigrant cringe <laughs> moments of seeing your parents, but that's kind of a lot of it is, you know, I mean just you know, like when um he, someone's just dis- describing the, the Brazilian um waxing and she says you don't know brazilian and he goes of course what about pele like, that's not <laughs> yeah. sarcasm that's just him being so earnest and that's just your yes. usual, like cringe moment or like for me a lot of it was my parents in order to be korean they did not want to give up any authority so when i would ask them how mm. you pronounce certain words like femme fatale my dad would say oh it's femme fatale and um, it's pronounced gristique. And the, the girl with the long hair is Rapunzel. And so instead of, do you understand? So it's kind of like the culture is yes. changing yes. on my experience, yes. but in a way that I don't understand. So that kind of helped me also get into the mind of Einstein being so puzzled mm. by his father or where the puzzlement is quite mutual. Yeah, because Einstein has, you know, grown up in this, you know, small town, mining town, Minnesota, and with surrounded by white people. Right. All, my, many, many of whom share the same surname. Exactly. Yeah. So he doesn't think diff- he's, yeah. Oh, no, please don't let me cut you off. Oh, no, he's just, he feels like he's just a regular old horse, horse's breather, just like everyone else. So. <laughs> Of course, Horace's Breath is the name of the small Minnesota mining town where we first meet these characters. Okay. Um, I, I, Is there anything that you don't get to talk about a lot in interviews that really lights you on fire about this book? Anything about craft? Anything about structure? Anything about character? You know, something that you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, well, besides that, the thing that you brought up about that timeline, so glad. Yeah. Um, because yeah. that's always been something on my mind. I think one thing that I enjoy, and it's more retrospective, but I think probably because I've been thinking about it a lot more, given um, so much of the anti-Asian sentiment, you know, not just 2016, but then there was COVID and there's all this violence. 
you know, it's sort of the idea that, oh, Asians are alike and we all have, to, you know, we're all falling to these tropes. We're quiet, we're docile, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm kind of, when I'm looking back on this, I'm kind of enjoying the idea that Koreans in particular are not quiet and Koreans, like, I'm not saying this in a sensualist way, but culture wise are very, very funny and humorous. Yes. So I don't know if you've seen any, like, I don't know, Korean zombie movies, but if you see like Train to Busan or some of these that have made crossovers, because you know, like the George mm -hmm. Romero, the zombies are always kind of like lurching around. But the Korean zombies, first, they're super fast because Koreans are overachievers. Yeah. They're super fast. But there's always like a moment where there's some dumb slapstick because someone trips over something stupid. So they get eaten by the zombie. <laughs> Maybe. So I kind of feel like there's a, always this yin yang or like the humor. There, there really is always like humor is always let in, even in the most dire circumstances. And I think that um, I really enjoyed that John Waters has said that he said that everything I've ever done is about using humor as a weapon. And it's how you yeah. to change their mind. And I just thought, yeah. Sort of kind of as an artist, I don't think I did that intentionally, but some of the idea is, I also feel like there's so many Western tropes, especially about writing about war, where it's, oh no, this happened, this happened, this is so awful, and this happened, which, you know, it's all true, but that without, when it's so relentless, I think it's more difficult to change people's minds about sort of humanity, or you can actually get numb to like the amount of brutality that there is in war. So yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's one of the things I'm, you know, I, you know, sort of my challenge to myself is, can I write a funny book about war and all this brutality and, you know, colonization? So that's what I hope you it. have, you know, which I express with reluctance, too, because, you know, as as your interviewer, I'm uh, my first priority is to show respect, you know, and so I'm not sure at like which, you know, and we don't know one another. We're not even in the same room. I can't even <laughs> see your body language. And so I'm not sure at like which frequency 100 percent we're plugged into because I'm missing all those attendant clues. But I have to say it's also a funny book. It's a funny book. In addition to all the, it's like, it's just all these other splendid things it is. Oh, I'm so happy. In, in fact, when I was talking to some booksellers, um, I actually just said, you know, my editor was just dropping the F-bomb and saying, this book is effing funny. And that's kind of the <laughs> deal. So that's why I just yeah. kind of felt like I really appreciated that it wasn't, you know, he was comparing the book more to a lot of funny books. You know, there were some, he was also, you know, there's been some comparison to like Anthony Doerr's, like all the love you cannot see and mm -hmm. just some war themes. But at the same time, yeah, there is, I like to think it's humor's book. And I'm, I want to say I'm a humor writer, but you know what? I think also one of the, the writers that really influenced me a lot is Sinclair Lewis. Oh. Yeah. Well, he's also from Minnesota. And yes. He writes a lot about, you know, small town and he's very funny. So, you know, we have Babbitt and, and then he also wrote that really scary book. It, um, it can't happen here. That was very Trump esque and really scary because he wrote it in 1935. Um, right. And then the weirdest thing is I found, I recently found out, oh, wow, this book is actually from 1925. I found this really old book called Aerosmith, which was a Sinclair Lewis book that seems like it's completely fallen off the radar, but I believe he either won the Pulitzer or the National Book Award for it. <laughs> I know this is what happens. Like the whole, this is such a literary memento mori for me. Oh yeah. I can't remember, but it was either the Pulitzer or the National Book Awards. And this book is a, is like a medical satire. And as my editor would say, it's, it's effing funny. It's just, it was just funny and just, you know, it's all about this guy wants to be, you know, this great researcher, but then he, he's tempted by becoming famous and, and it just kind of all goes to pot. And so, yeah, that book was also a big, like a big, not, not a precursor, but I think between that mm -hmm. and Middlemarch, um, those were kind of the, the two real touchstones for me. So it was kind of like, you know, it's it's obviously about Koreans and Korean Americans, but yeah. it's it's very deeply rooted in the idea of how also how do we live together with e with each other, you know, like within the hospital, the weird hierarchies, and just within life. And here's young man having to depilate people's vaginas, and yet he becomes somewhat <laughs> attached to some of the patients, and you know, and he ends up in this racial imbroglio. And I don't know if I'm saying that 
word right, by the way, but I, you know, I say imbroglio, but don't go by me. Ser- I'm serious. I, you don't know how often through the day I Google and listen to press the little, you know, the little speaker icon to hear right. how to pronounce words like t- dozens and dozens of times a day. Listen, we are really cruising close to the end of our allotted time together. But I was wondering if you have one more time for what's not really a quick question, but we're going to try and make it one. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for being up for the challenge. Okay. You're a founder of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Yes. Founded in 1991. Way to go. Nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was, I just was really curious, the success of this organization, where it, where it is in 2022, do you see it as the fulfillment of a grand vision you all had, or has it been a series of decisions made and turns taken on the road to life? I think it's interesting because I was the first like published author there and now everyone's getting published and my co-founder also has a publishing mm. a contract now. I think it's similar to, I was going, how can you have to spend 18 years on a novel? And I'm going, I didn't know it was going to take 18 years when I started this. <laughs> you know, and so when the four of us were starting at this, you know, just speaking at a restaurant going, oh, everyone's asking me, why am I, you know, not writing like Amy Tan or why am I writing like Amy Tan? Or there's not enough rice in this story. You know, oh, we, geez. You know what I mean? We started with that. Yeah, yeah. And then we thought we need to make low cost workshops available for people. So one of the low cost workshops, the first ones we had was Edlin, Kathy Park Hong, Lisa Ko, Ninja Lee. They were all in the same class. And I know I'm forgetting someone else. Um, and then we just got this, you know, totally unknown person named Jubilee Yuri to teach it. Right. So right. it just kind go. of it just kind of kept going and going. And then ironically, over pandemic, I started, I was in this writing group with some friends and they said, well, I'll bring a friend. So I brought Curtis and then she brought her Asian friend and then my other friend came. So the three out of the four founders of an Asian writing group again. So it all kind of, it just happens. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and we're seriously, we're seriously not that old. <laughs> You heard it here, listeners. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Marie, I have to say, this has been a joy to speak with you start to finish. Thank you so, so much for joining me today on Fully Booked. Oh, thank you for such great questions. I loved it. My pleasure. Oh, what a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 